I am now going to take you through how to respond to the Shakespeare questions. So to start with, uh, we've got the extract question. So this uh, will, you'll get about 20 minutes in the exam, uh, maybe 20 to 25 minutes, because uh, this is only worth 15 marks and the rest of the Shakespeare time, which is an hour, is worth 25 marks. So about 20 to 25 minutes. So we haven't got much time. Uh, usually it will be, how does the audience respond to this part of the play? Um, look at how the characters speak and behave here. Um, there has once been an atmosphere question, so how does Shakespeare create atmosphere here? It um, was on a cello the first year. However, the majority of the time it is how does the audience respond? Now, this again is a potential way you can start um, your response to the extract question. Um, and I'll explain why this is good in a second. This extract is taken from um, and then use terminology to say were. Uh, were then tell us what happens or what's just happened and then the most significant mo this th sorry that should be the the most significant moment in this extract is so just to go back to your terminology um you can choose from the the ones that are in the brackets there so exposition is the start of the play the rise in action is anything f after the exposition to uh, the midpoint which is the middle of the play the climax is the moment of um, sort of the most tension and drama on the stage. Um, and then the fall in action is everything after that to the resolution, which is obviously the ending where everything is wrapped up, which in a tragedy is when everybody's dead. Um, the reason why this is good then is because firstly, you get in terminology ticked off straight away um, by using your dramatic term techniques in terms of structure. Um, you're showing an understanding of the play and an, a knowledge and engagement of the play if you can explain which part of the play it comes from. Um, again, that's what's demonstrated by you being able to just summarise what's happening and what has just happened would get you more marks because it shows you're engaged enough to realise what's happened before it. And then the most significant moment in this extract is an evaluative statement. You have looked at the extract as a student and you've not just started with the first quotation. You've actually looked at the whole thing and you thought, right, which of these quotations matters the most? Which has the most significance um, for the rest of the play, for how we respond to the play? By writing that, that evaluative statement, the most significant moment, um, you're setting yourself up as a band five student in the, in the examiner's head. Again, this is optional. OK, um, right. What is an optional, however, is that you have to cover the entire extract. And when I say entire, I mean um, you obviously don't have to pick up every quotation, but you need to be covering the most vital parts. Um, do not miss out sort of the last half or the last third of the extract, because there's a reason they started and ended the extract at that point. So you need to make sure you're covering the start, the end, and then as many things in the middle as you can. And the most cohesive way to do that is to track it. So to start at the beginning and work your way through. And that is after you've done the most significant moment, which obviously would not be in order because you've plucked that out to show that you know which is the most significant. OK, uh, make sure you show off your WLA, word level analysis. This is your main chance. Um, I had lunch with one of the examiners once who said, um, you know, in the essay question, you're forced to have to remember your quotations. Here they're in front of you. Use them, pick them apart, show off your ability to pick up heart language while you've got the quotations in front of you. Uh, link to other parts of the play briefly, but do link them. Um, and there's potential sentences here for how you can do that. So you can say how this builds on um, the opening scene where the character was first established as blah, blah, blah. Or in the case of Romeo and Juliet, this builds on the expectations set out in the prologue, because obviously the prologue indicates everything that's going to happen. Um, for Othello, you might say, this builds on um, the expectations of a tragedy already established by the fact that there's a wedding before the play begins. Um, you could say it builds on Iago's, uh, the pre Shakespeare's presentation of Iago as a source of antagonism in the first scene, things like that. Um, another way of, of linking to previous parts of the play is to say, given that the audience is already aware of, uh, that's a great one for Roman and Juliet, already aware that they're going to die, um, for Othello, already aware that Iago's acting against Othello, or already aware of Rodrigo's love, already aware of society's, um, um, what's the word, um, I don't know, disgust <laughs> uh, at the idea of the marriage, or... Um, Anything like that is what you can refer to there. 
If you're linking to future parts of the play, then you can say this prepares the audience for blah blah blah, or you can say this effectively shadow foreshadows blah blah blah. Okay, um, so in Romeo and Juliet, the prince when he declares that he will um, place death upon whoever um, disturbs the sheets again, this obviously prepares for the consequences of Romeo's actions when he kills Tybalt. Um, in Othello. Um, I think maybe Othello's um, signs of insecurities in Act 1, Scene 3 that he thinks that he's not blessed with the soft spot parts of speech proposes for the uh, impact that Iago can have on him, his insecurities and how they can play a part and make him more susceptible to Iago, for example. Okay, uh, and another one, this sets up the dramatic irony which is exploitable, blah, blah. So Act 1, Scene 1 of Othello sets up the dramatic irony that Iago is working against him, which is then exploited in the very next scene when Iago is being beautifully dutiful to Othello. Obviously, you would write that if you had the extract, which was the scene where he's being dutiful to Othello. Um, Romeo and Juliet, the prologue, is always... Um, is always... useful. Okay. Uh, Shakespeare questions, essay question. So like I said just then, maybe 35 to 40 minutes on the essay question. It will usually be how is a character or theme presented across the no novel, um, uh, sorry, play. Very, I've not really seen any others. Um, in class sometimes we've done, you know, to what extent do you feel sympathy for a character or you, but in a way they would be a gift, sent, a, a gift because you'd sort of encouraged to evaluate there. But just basically, you'll usually get how is a character or theme presented across the text. Just answer the question that you're given. Um, this, again, is a potential way that you can start your essay question. So if you get character, you could say Shakespeare uses character to teach his audience that, blah, blah, blah. Throughout the play, he or she is presented as blah, blah, blah. That would be a nice band five start. Uh, for the theme, Shakespeare teaches his audience that jealousy, love, blah, blah, blah is something and something, so some of the ways that he, he presents whatever the theme is. And then I think this is really what will nail you band five. This is primarily shown through the character of. So think about which character in the play really is responsible for conveying this theme. And the same goes for Christmas Carol and Inspector Carls as well. Um, but obviously there's always going to be more than one character, otherwise it wouldn't be a theme. There wouldn't be the repetitive references to it to make it a theme. Uh, so you can then consider how it's further developed by someone. So um, for Othello, um, Shakespeare teaches audience that jealousy is blah, 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 blah. This is primarily shown through the character of Othello, without a doubt. However, it's also developed by Iago, Amelia and Bianca. Um, <sighs> Uh, nah, not Cassio. I was thinking maybe Cassio could be said to be jealous of Iago's ability to drink, but I don't think you've got enough evidence for that, sorry. Um, so that's an example. An example for Roman Juliet, um, Shakespeare primarily teach, teaches audience that violence is blah blah blah. This is primarily shown through the character of Tybalt, uh, but is further developed by Mercutio, Romeo, the, 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 the feud itself. Okay. Uh, right, you need to cover the entire play, and I can't emphasise this enough. If you don't analyse the ending of the play, you are not going to get top marks. You're not going to get into the top band. You need to make sure you're covering the beginning, the middle and the end, and as many key bits in between as you've got time to do. Um, one of the ways I taught students last year was uh, to analyse the beginning compare it to the end and then go back and explore how they get to the ending uh, and that's just a way to make sure you've covered the ending in case you're short on time or if you're out of time um you could do the same for christmas carol and actually works better for best for christmas carol because you can't really analyze stave one without comparing it to stave five effectively um you know to make your analysis slower you should be doing that anyway um so that's something you can consider doing uh, and this links to this, always cross-reference where possible. So don't just isolate a moment of the play. Actually think about how it's built on in other parts of the play. Is it contrasted in any other parts of the play? And make sure you make links between individual quotations and Shakespeare's bigger ideas and purposes. M same as we said with the Christmas Carol and Inspector Collins, you need to be asking yourself why. Why are those words chosen by Shakespeare? What impact do they have? How do they help him to convey the messages he wants to convey? Shakespeare in tragedies teach the audience things about the world around them. They make them feel like 
bad things just happen and give them a sense of catharsis that that you know good people can go bad or good intentions can have bad consequences they're full of life lessons they're full of le lessons for what it is to mean what it means to be human to be flawed and you need to be able to pick those apart and link them um as you're going through to those individual quotations um so for example um there's a beautiful line in othello where iago says that cassio's cassio's beauty makes him feel ugly and and that's such a beautiful quotation and and at a basic level it's just emphasizing why he's so why he hates cassio why he's so determined to get him and get him and, and destroy his reputation but actually there's something deeper there that shakespeare's teaching us about human beings and how we like to be surrounded by people who are like us and if we're surrounded by people who are constantly better than us it just makes us feel bad about ourselves so that's an example of, of how you can link um individual quotations to bigger ideas and purposes <coughs> excuse me um <clears throat> Uh, another another link another sorry a roman Juliet example might be um mercutio sort of he when he's berating romeo um for not fighting etc actually tells us a lot about masculine values masculine traits how human be how men are sort of raised to be that way you might think about the conflict between feminine traits and masculine traits and how romeo is actually quite a feminine man for his time and you might use that quotation of mercutio you know um speaking to romeo in that way as being a symbol of those bigger issues regarding masculinity and femininity okay right i just want to talk about the importance of evaluation because i didn't touch on this in the inspector calls christmas cow video and it is really important and um, this is basically where you're weighing up different interpretations or looking for conflicting evidence and you can see this in the shakespeare um exemplar response video as well um so for example romeo's love for julia is pure and true that's an argument you might make about romeo okay however you should also be considering to be evaluative you, you need to almost be engaged with your own arguments you need to think would these stand up in court or would somebody have something else to say would somebody have a different suggestion a different argument that you'd have to fight against it's like you've got to put on your defense hat and your um prosecutor hat you've got to play both roles so yes it's pure and true but do his feelings to towards well, well line counter that you need to think about that is this actually a good thing is it good that he's just so deeply and purely in love with a woman he's just met should romeo dilute his preoccupation with love with some logic some like mercutio says to him this idea of queen mab infecting your brain actually should he be less of a dreamer should he be more pragmatic uh so they're the kind of things you could think about to evaluate um your arguments just always be asking yourself a is it actually a good thing what does shakespeare suggest about it is there any other evidence in other parts of the play that counter this idea um and you know is there a lesson to be learned there uh, an example for othello jealousy is presented as predominantly a male trait so you might argue that that shakespeare does present it as as something that affects males more uh, there's plenty of evidence to support that in the play however a good evaluation a good evaluative student would think well actually that's not the only evidence i can find counter evidence so you could consider um emilia in act four she expresses a disillusionment with men's needs to discard of women once they've been consumed so there's an element of jealousy there that she feels like she'll never be enough and um, that other women will always be on her husband's radar or, or generally on men's radars uh, it's that's something you can consider also bianca her jealous reaction when she finds cassio's handkerchief and does she have any rights to this jealousy she is a prostitute does she have any rights to come and, and complain to cassio that he's sleeping with another woman and actually what does that reveal about her it reveals that she's insecure it reveals that she is jealous because she feels like something that she's something she feels like she's responsible for isn't enough like she feels like she's not enough for cassio he's having to look elsewhere so does that emphasize that jealousy as an emotion is born from our insecurities and um, does it emphasize that it's not predominantly a male trait that it's a human being trait it's a, a trait of all of us um does it what does it emphasize about the root causes of jealousy and really trying to just dig deeper all, all the time there's always 
going to be sort of more depth to your statements that you're making so just keep on thinking is there more to this like actually what's this saying about human beings what's this saying about the causes of it what's this saying about um something like where it comes from what is what what manipulates it where what, what drives it and just keep on digging dig 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 okay